So what, same demo, but now I want to show you Oracle. And I apologize for all these windows here, but. Okay, so for Oracle, we go back to the same user interface and uh, oddly enough, we have the same name for the Oracle database as the SQL database. <laughs> Uh, it's also called Big D, DB, so but it's not. It's Oracle. There. Yes, we're very imaginative. Um, so I'm going to take an Oracle database, and everyone loves a good command line demo, right? So we'll go ahead and do that. <laughs> There's no better way to show Oracle, in my, in my, uh, my opinion. So this is a Red Hat 6, I think, um, Oracle server, Linux server. And we're running this script every two seconds that shows me the Oracle uh, processes and the file systems. And so again, in the interest of time, let me kick it off and then start talking about it. I do need a little bit of information. If I'm gonna do the same thing we just showed you for Oracle, I need to know what Oracle instance to put it into, what environment, right? And that's Oracle Home. So I'm just gonna get that from the server here. So same thing, different database with the same name. I'm gonna do another access operation. Again, it's gonna ask me, you know, which image do you want? I'll just take one of these recent ones. Doesn't really matter for this. I'm gonna click on the uh, mount operation. I'm gonna choose my host. On this case, it knows where the data is and it knows what hosts are there. This is on-premise. I, I have a lot more stuff here, right? We're, we're in AWS, I only had two or three systems. So the global manager is smart enough to just show me what's relevant, which I think is pretty cool. It's gonna say, okay, what do you wanna call this? You can label things for management. We'll call it test DB. You know, what user do you wanna use? Oracle, what's your Oracle home? Well, that's not it. Hang on. Let me get the full path here to Oracle Home. Better? Where's your TNS ad admin? And then you can set a uh, memory, right? How much memory do you want to see? Again, this has different, different um, options, right, for Oracle than SQL, obviously. But this is the last mile DBA type stuff that they're gonna, they're gonna um, configure when they're, when they're doing these things. Um, so I wanna make sure I got this right before I click the button, Oracle Home slash network, slash admin, and my memory specified. Okay, so we're gonna do the same thing. In this case, it's not going to Windows. It's not in the cloud, it's on-prem. Um, but similar idea, we're gonna take a dynamically generated volume that's gonna have all the data on it in native format uh, from that Oracle database, uh, application consistently from that point in time. We're gonna present it to wherever it's going. In this case, it's a Red Hat Linux server. Uh, we're gonna rescan the bus to find the, the block device, Couple times, we're gonna check the IDs on both sides and make sure that's, a, that's the right disk. Then we're going to, in this case, uh, mount the file system because this Oracle database was a standalone uh, Oracle uh, in a file system database. Uh, we also have a really cool integration uh, with Oracle Rack. We can actually bring um, um, databases in um, ASM format, not just Rack, but ASM. Uh, Oracle ASM format into these environments with, with uh, volume groups. So you can have a, a two node Oracle or a five node Oracle rack cluster in production and you wanna bring virtual copies into a two node Oracle rack cluster for dev test, uh, we can actually do that maintaining <coughs> that ASM format, uh, which is really, really important for customers that performance and, and scalability like, and availability of, of those features are important to them. Uh, but in this case, it's a, a single uh, standalone file system. So you'll, you'll soon see a new file system show up. I think in this case, it's about uh, a terabyte or so in size. Just over. Just over? So while that's running, I can, I can again go back to my system, my system monitor here. There's the job running right there, 48% done. Once the file system shows up, then again, just like with SQL, we're gonna do the application specific stuff. So we're gonna bring up the Oracle database, we're gonna give it the right SID, we're gonna bring it up with the right memory, we're gonna use the correct <coughs> Oracle home environment, all that stuff that can take a customer DBA hours or longer to, to set up from some dump file or even a storage array snapshot. Uh, really giving customers not only the, the, the self-service, like I'm kind of showing you now, the end users can come in there and do this themselves, uh, but it also allows us to automate this, uh, which is where we're gonna go next. Do you have also the integration as you had before with the VMware environment for that SRM replacement that you can update DNS, for example, to point to this new SQL database? So in this case, um, we have <coughs> Resiliency Directors, the product, that is a, a virtual machine specific product. We do have Mika Waldman's in the, in the room, our VP of product management. Uh, if you want to speak to... Um... Yeah, so we're, we are actually extending Resiliency Director to allow you to uh, bring up any combination of um, 
uh, virtual machines and databases or any other application data that you capture with Actifio. Okay. So that's definitely the next step. Can you do also the, because the part of the, the VMware uh, migration to DR, you could change the IP addresses and you could also update DNS. Right. Can you do the update DNS bit example for, for say, SQL or? Yeah, as part of the recovery plan, absolutely. Okay. Yep. Wow. Yeah, there, there's, there's pre and post scripts that you can run at, at the VM level or just arbitrarily. So you can actually do you know, SSH type sessions into switches, load balancers, DNS systems and, and run you know, different different um, updates and things like that if you need to do that. But not for the VMware, also for the database part? That's Today it's for the VMware. What okay. Mika is saying is it's coming for the, okay. the database part. Yes, we're at 69% done here, so should be showing up. It's usually about four or five minutes. Any other uh, any other questions while we're waiting for this to, to finish? Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, notice you've got AWS listed for public cloud, <clears throat> and you've got a lot of Microsoft uh, uh, integration, especially for SQL Server. Yes. Azure? Miko, do you want to come in on uh, Azure? <laughs> yeah, so we, we just like uh, Sky is running on AWS, uh, we're working on having Sky run on Azure. Um, and absolutely, um, you know, as, as you mentioned, we have a lot of integration with the Microsoft applications, um, and that's definitely the next step. Four, four big clouds for us. AWS is the start. Um, Azure is, is there next. Is your mic on? I'm sorry. <laughs> turn it off. Uh, so f f ne four never turn off your mic at tech field. I got a little bit like a <laughs> stereo now. Well, four, four, four big clouds for right. us from the, from the customer perspective. I mean, one of the first things that uh, we took an approach was we were going to be enterprise centric. We'll start with the enterprise customer and say, what clouds do you want to go to? As opposed to jump to the cloud as centric and say, hey, what can I do with you? Uh, so we looked at four big ones for us. AWS, just because it's so far ahead of everybody else. It, it just there. Uh, second uh, is uh, Azure. Third, we started working very closely with Oracle. Huge Oracle install base. The ability for many of our Oracle customers to move 400, 500 of their, of their developers to use a rented cloud is huge. I mean, it, it, their ability to log in and suddenly find themselves doing development somewhere. They have no idea where. You know, it happens to happen in, in, a, in a rental place called Oracle Public Cloud. That's a that's big, big one. And the last one we'll probably show you is on Google. And partly to drive a very interesting technology called Ready Vault that allows people to use Vault, a traditional Vault, which is like a dumb place to you know, store your data, into a very active analytics engine. You can actually use your Vault to go back and do some phenomenal analytics in the back. Uh, there's some demo we're doing uh, for, from operations perspective to allow people to come back and take care of things like uh, you know, verify my seven-year-old images are actually valid. Or let me run some retail analytics on what is considered this dumb storage device that I never used before. So those are the four ones. And then there's, a, <clears throat> there's another one we're working on as part of a partnership with IBM on the software, but very, very specific to their services business uh, on a case-by-case -case basis. We have about 60 large service providers who are powered by Actifio, SunGuard, IBM, uh, CenturyLink, Time Warner, AT&T. I'm sorry? Verizon. Verizon. <clears throat> And many of them have a combination. Some of them have their own infrastructure and data center. And some of them actually you want to use as part of their tiered structure, somebody else's infrastructure. And all of this is completely seamless. The ability for them to, I mean, somebody asked, the, the idea is simple. We, we want to come back and say, you know, the one thing that is common across any infrastructure, whether it's power PC or cloud is data. This is one of those, you know, the, the analogy we give is, there's this enormous power that is generated by Niagara Falls. And how do I capture it and bring it into every house in New York <clears throat> and convert you it into- Nikola the, Tesla. <laughs> convert to power, exactly. <laughs> convert to power, convert into a portable format that is universal that can be converted back. And we believe data is that portable format that can truly, especially as more and more infrastructure gets virtualized, the ability to convert everything into data and then orchestrate it, be very efficient, and resynthesize infrastructure back. And what we're really doing here is, we're literally bringing back, quote unquote, all the blinking lights back in someplace else, except we've been using data as the medium. And so far we've been just showing you apps and data. You'll start seeing us bring up servers, entire data centers, and uh, in a selective, I mean, you know, uh, John might be allowed to see only 14 applications out of the entire data center, versus Julian might see you know, 45 of them. 
and you selectively get. And at the end, at the end, I'll talk to you maybe off camera about something else they're working on, as an as an industry standard, uh, to try to create a very portable format of what a data center should look like. Sorry, long answer. Did I finish you 100 percent yet? Yeah, my uh, my. <laughs> thank you, Ash. No, my partner in crime, Anthony, uh, informed me that I, I tried to mount that Linux database to a Windows machine. So uh, this isn't going to work. <laughs> uh, I I, uh, I chose yeah. Demo Management 11 instead you, of Demo. You might Oracle. be able to run Bash on Windows 2000. <laughs> so EXT3 is not going to work. So uh, not the first time I've done that, by the way. So oh, you resubmit. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So the man behind the curtain resubmitted. But it's actually a good segue. I'm There's a man this. behind the curtain. <laughs> <laughs> Pay no attention to that. That's right. And so, any yeah. sufficiently advanced Magic. technology is indistinguishable from a rig demo. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no rig demo here, as you can tell. Um, so similarly, I've got four uh, of these servers. This is Oracle 7, 8, 9, and 10, um, where we have this automated so that I can't fat finger it. So let's show you that. Um, this is using, um, and, and Chandra's got a slide in this as well. Maybe I should kick this off, and then you can yeah, do the slide in the interest of time here. Um, but this is going to showcase how customers use our APIs to integrate with uh, different orchestration tools or DevOps tools. A lot of our larger customers uh, might not use that user interface that I've been showing you for all the day-to-day -day stuff. They might just use a RESTful API that we have to do it, uh, integrate with some script they already have. They might use Chef, Puppet, Ansible, SaltStack, you name it. Um, so what we've built here in the lab is a um, kind of a proof of concept integration with um, with Ansible, and I will go ahead and start that off to kind of uh, highlight how this all works. But everything that we have here at Actifio, whether it's a global manager, whether it's um, integrations with third-party tools like this, everything we do is built on our own uh, RESTful API, including our user interface. So all capabilities are available in the GUI, command line, API, um, or, or a mix of all the above. Is there a tool to have things I do in the GUI expo exposed back to me as REST? There's an audit log, absolutely. You can pull the actual, pull the audit log and see what the, what the, what the yeah, system the commands first, are. I always want to do things in the GUI the first yes, time, right. mm -hmm. and then I want it to tell me what the API that generated was so I can do it the next 4,000 times. Exactly. And to avoid uh, you know, fat fingering things like I just did. Uh, well, that and, <laughs> that and ever having to open the REST API manual. Oh, of course, of course. So let's just go ahead and kick this off, then I'll let Chandra kind of... Um, Show, show a quick slide that, that shows what we're doing. But we've got different playbooks here, which is the Ansible um, you know, terminology. There's one here called Provision Virtual Data. And I'm just gonna go ahead and click on Run and Authenticate here. And what this is doing is we're running this on a, um, on a host group that's actually got 10 Oracle, um, uh, Oracle Red Hat Linux servers in our lab. And so I've got four of them here, front and center. So it's gonna be similar demo to what I was just trying to show you. Um, where we're going to take virtual copies of data and present it to 10 servers at the same time, all 10 at once, rescan the buses, bring the data in, bring up Oracle to a predetermined um, you know, state with a, with a SID name that's fixed, with a memory that's fixed, all that's defined um, externally, not by our user interface, but by this Ansible playbook. So if I refresh this, you'll see it's going to switch over to running, and there's some standard out you can look at as well. Um, so I don't know, Chandra, if you want to jump into the slide real quick while this is going. This will probably take about three or four minutes. Can you bring up the slide? Yeah, sure. Can you hear me? Yep. So this is very much how you're going to integrate into a, a CI, CD pipeline that a developer, without n even knowing it, Actifio is in the... You read my mind. That a, <laughs> <laughs> so Actifio is the, a developer wouldn't even know Actifio is in the background and uh, Ansible, Saltstack, Chef, Puppet, whatever would go along its thing, he, the code would be pushed up, they would mount the database, run all the integration tests, pass, fail, whatever, and, and carry Precisely. on. Precisely, yep, perfect. Nice. Yeah, that's exactly what we want to do. Because you walk into an environment, many customers are just fine leveraging our active user interface, but there will be shops where they, are already have these, they already have these established practices and they want to continue with that. And the last thing you want to go to developers and ask them to learn some new user interface, we don't want to do that. So. So here is an example of how this ActiveView can be leveraged in a classic develop, uh, you know, agile development environment, especially in CI environments. Um, so you have production databases. ActiveView creates the golden copy. Remember, in the snapshot pool, it automatically masks the data. <coughs> then what happens is, imagine that we all are developers here. We all are writing code. I know you're you writing code in Twitter right now. But similarly, <laughs> imagine that we are writing code here. The moment we write code, Nobody checks in the code. We all have to do some level of unit testing. 
Now, the first interface where it comes in is when they do unit testing, they can use Ansible tool that just Brylan just demonstrated to you and provision a virtual database on every one of their test machines. So now they have the virtual databases, they wrote the code, they test it, and now when they are satisfied, they check in the code. Could be any source code repository, could be Microsoft Team Foundation or Git, GitHub. Now, once they all check in the code, the next most important thing is there has to be an integration testing because each one of you wrote some piece of code and now it needs to work together, right? So now, any build tool could come in and take that code and start creating builds. Depending on how large is the uh, source code, it might take anywhere from 15 minutes to four hours. While the build is being created, what this framework can also do is that you could use Chef, Puppet, Ansible, or any other homegrown tool to start spinning up test machine. They could spin up 20 test machines because they want to put the build on each of the test machine and do some automation testing. So now these test machines obviously would come off a gold template. Typically people have templates and these virtual machines are being provisioned off those templates and this will have operating system stack, application stack, etc. The next thing is um, what they would want to do is a tool like Jenkins would come in and then talk to Actifio via APIs and provision the virtual databases on all these test machines. It could be any tool. In this example, I'm picking Jenkins because it's pretty popular to deploy builds. So they can easily put a plug-in, a script in Jenkins, and Jenkins will talk to Actifio, invoke the APIs, provision the virtual databases on all these test machines. So now what do you have? So far, the build was being created and simultaneously you got the test machines provision and the virtual data provision. The next thing to do is, as soon as the build comes out, Jenkins would take the bill and deploy it on all these test machines. So now you created a perfect storm. You have, the, um, you, you have the test machines, you have the complete application stack, you have the virtual databases, which are copies of genuine copies of production. So the next step is that it kicks off the test automation framework, which will execute, let's say, 90% of the uh, test cases automa fully automated. And once those test cases um, are executed, it emails out the results to the rest of the developers. So as you can see here, completely eliminated any manual intervention from the point where the developers checked in the code to the point where they get an email notification on how good they, was their code. There's absolutely uh, you know, zero intervention needed from anybody. Everything is automated. The value that Actifio brought in was creating provisioning virtual databases and people uh, DevOps consuming Actifio's functionality via the APIs into their familiar tools. Perfect. Did I, did, does this make sense? So there you can see our job has been progressing. Thank you, Chandra. Sure. And this is what we should have saw in the other demo. So we have 1.1 terabyte of used data on all four of these. These are virtual copies coming from our Actifio system that were not there before. <coughs> and we've also created an, a database called DevDB on all these through, through a source of uh, 30 API calls. We actually do three API calls per 10 servers to achieve this in this particular instance. Um, and you know, start to finish, we can go to our, our job monitor here. Uh, I don't have the, the stopwatch going, but you can four see minutes four minutes and 22 seconds to spin up 10 copies of a one terabyte database on 10 different systems. Uh, that would take customers doing things the old fashioned way a long time, regardless of what technology they were using. And with zero impact to available capacity on the underlying storage as well. Absolutely right. These are all uh, thin provisioned copies, each one of these. So you have a one terabyte usable, read writable Oracle database. I mean, let's, let's take a look at one of these. If I just pick one of these servers here, it's a, it's a good point. So well, does the right I.O. also then go back through Activio? Yes. Correct. So this is the mount point we did. Again, you can specify these mount points you know, as well. It's one of the options I glossed over. If I go into this directory, this is what looks like a bunch of Oracle files, right? And I go into the, uh, you know, full disclosure, I'm no, uh, I'm no Oracle DBA here. Here's the data files. And, I'm, you know, you want to write to the file system? Sure, go ahead. It's read-writable. The user would have no idea this is a virtual copy. Yeah. Um, so they're, they're getting the, the benefit of having the full one terabyte database with their data in it that they can use for reporting analytics, test dev, recovering corrupted, <coughs> excuse me, data files, um, but they don't have to pay for it, right? They're only using one copy on the back end. Only the rights that you make are, are consumed. But that's different when they're in uh, AWS because it's all EBS volumes that are being provisioned out. No, it's the same, it's the same it's principle. So the same? the same thin provisioning applies. So there would cool. be one copy on the EBS volume. The and EBS is attached to the Actifio correct. appliance, and then you're doing a... Exactly right. Actifio provides 10 delivery. virtual copies, and you only pay for the rights. Nice. 